Lisa, I like how you brought this weather today. Where did you find it? You know, I flew to Italy. Yes. And then I brought it back with me, and here it is. Wow, I really like that. So, <laughs> so uh, and it's an enjoyable to be in a really sunny garden, a gravel garden, one that sort of repeats Italy, and here we have the weather that really goes along with it. So, uh, and joining us today is Kristen. Kristen is the designer for all of this, and we're at Freeling Heights and Arboretum. And I have to admit that even though I work here and I've met and known her for a number of years, uh, I am being totally impartial. She is a stellar gardener, so uh, and a great designer. So uh, it, I think Freeling Heisen in Morris County is proud to have her as part of the the whole team. So uh, and look at that, she's speechless. So yes, that's <laughs> right. thank you, Bruce, for that very very kind introduction. Um, this was a great project for me. I had a lot of fun. It really allowed me to be very creative mm -hmm. and try a lot of new things. So what was the, because this wasn't like this a year ago. So it what, was not. <laughs> so, so what was, uh, and then everything is sort of recreated over time. So what was this prior to you redoing it? So before I redid this, this was a shade garden. Um, roughly uh, about a foot in front of us was a very, very large Norway maple. I was which, wondering what cast the shade. <laughs> which declined and was removed a couple years, probably a couple years before I started here in 2019. Um, and all of the plants that had been in this area were shade plants, um, lots okay. of hellebores, things like that. Okay. And so after this was removed, this garden sat empty for a long time while we figured out what we were going to do in here. Okay. Um, so when I came on board in 2019, I started thinking about it. In 2020, I had the beginnings of a functioning plan for a gravel garden, figuring mm -hmm. to capitalize on our nice sunny location. Yes. Um, especially that it would add connectivity to our rock garden and alpine garden, which are nearby. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of make the, the gardens as a whole more cohesive. Okay. Um, so, and, and Lisa's a designer, and I know she picked up on a few things like the silver plants in here. Um, what was some of your inspiration for? Um, so some of my inspiration comes from Chanticleer. Um, I really love their gravel garden, it's very beautiful. Let me see, was by chance were you there this week? Hmm, yeah. yes I was, <laughs> I was there this week. <laughs> um, and I also looked at a lot of other Mediterranean style gardens. Um, I was particularly liking the artemisia, which is the silver mounding plant around mm -hmm. here. Um, it adds a lot of great texture sure. and helps. Sure. Yeah, those are those are especially beautiful, and they seem to be doing so well in this location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited to come back this year and see it kind of all filled in like this. Yeah. So since they're so large already. Um, are you going to let them just keep growing or are you going to prune them back at some point? So they're going to get a light prune this summer to take some of the weight off and then they'll get an actual pruning in the spring to kind of help them maintain their current size. Okay. Because the size they are at now is a really good size for this space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and do they flower? A little bit, but okay. they're not okay. exciting flowers. Okay. So we, we don't want things that are not exciting. So, no. <laughs> so, uh, so I think what we do all do, do is start to look around at the designs in each plant and sort of pull together what's exciting here. All right. Sounds good. All, all right. right. Go in there, buddy. Now as we nope. look at the stone steps here, I mean, these are really accentuated nicely because you sort of narrows down here as we go it through does. this planting. And then all of a sudden that makes when you come up to the top, it's like, oh. Wow, look at all this. Walk into something completely different. It just opens up right in front of you. I love this. So, uh, and, I, and I don't know who did your stonework, but really nice job because the, there's not, it's a very random pattern, but still it, uh, it fits nicely. And, uh, and you know where to walk. It, since it's sort of broken up and random like this, it makes you walk more slowly and it really allows you to enjoy the garden. I really like how it fit together. I think the stonework came out great. We got really lucky. We she had, did the stonework. We had an excellent teacher, though. <laughs> Bruce uh, educated us in the ways of laying stone, and it was a really fine team effort here with all the staff. It was a great so, day. A it was a good day. A lot of yeah. fun. So, a lot so. of fun. And I think one of the other things we were talking about, how they, the uh, space is narrowed down as you walked up those steps, but also you've created enclosure on this side with the yes. Japanese holly hedge. Which helps make this, give this garden definition and a firm boundary on that side while we drop off on this side to the gardens that are more close in theme and better connected to it. Correct. No, and I, I think 
I think a lot of people when they walk through here don't really perceive that or understand why why it's so successful. So, uh, and I also love how you balance the colors on either side. Yes, I was really trying hard to keep the silvers from becoming overwhelming. It would be easy to do. These are quite large, yeah. <laughs> voluminous. Yes, they're very luminous. <laughs> but but again, how that it's, uh, and you haven't planted every square inch of the place, so no. it allows the the mulch, the gravel to actually be part of the garden. It does, and I feel like the gravel also helps highlight some of the individual plants. Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. there are gaps, it'll draw your eye to a certain piece so that you really pay attention. For example, this grass over here, which oh. is a lovely side oats grandma, um, really catches your eye because it's out here by itself. And what's fun about it is that the uh, inflorescence are sideways, and uh, hence the common name but how it plays up in other areas. And so when you have it worked in with Russian sage and so forth, it has a very airy texture to it. So it comes up right through other plants. Uh, really, really well done how it's been positioned. Well, thank you. Um, it was used a lot on the other side of this planting to be a screen for a utility box that we couldn't do anything about. Um, so it helps hide that. And then we've also put some planters on that. Mm -hmm. um, we're quite fond of the planters that we were using in this space. Um, these rusty metal looking planters were very special. They add a modern feel as well as bring a dark color in here that makes the silver stand out even more. Yeah, I think it's the dark color that really gives you depth because uh, everything is very silvery as we were mentioning it, very light in color. And then you come in with this very dark bronzy color which, which gives that, that feeling of, of perspective with the, yes. uh, the garden really uh, benefits from. It and does. I remember from day one, you were like, we got to have these containers. And uh, <laughs> what do you mean I can't get them for a year? Oh, geez. So, uh, so they really have uh, done a yes, great job. I've been, here. I was really like, they were one of the first elements of the garden that I really settled on as this is definitely going to be a part of it. Cool. Cool. And what's another plant in here that really captured your whimsy? Really captured my whimsy? Um, well, I've been really into the Agastaches in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm particularly fond of the color of the one in the planters this year. It's yep. a very nice peachy pink color that just really brightens up the space. Do you know, remember the name of it? I do not. Okay. I think it's one of the ones that's supposed to be a little more annual, although I am going to try to plant it in to see if it'll come back. Good, good. I remember there was one named Tutti Fruity, which I always, which wasn't, it's not that one, I but I just, I love one, the name of the name. So, I do too. Uh, They've got some really funny names. I think I've got Mango Tango over there behind us. So. Um, so and we've also got one of my favorite little plants ah uh, yes the pickles <laughs> the pickle plant bruce really <laughs> loves the pickle plant i think i have one that's about to start flowering behind where we're standing in the other crevice garden um, and it's a really interesting little succulent it is supposed to be hardy here so we'll see how it does this will be its first winter um, so hopefully it does well i added some gravel when it was planted mm -hmm to give it some better drainage. Yep, yep. So uh, it's on the little knoll there and with the crevice garden. So, uh, um, and I'm trying it at home as well. So um, really good stuff. So, How's it doing uh, at home? Uh, yours is doing better. Interesting. But, yes, but I think it's the extra drainage that you have. So uh, uh, that really gives it the boost. So, uh, so anyway, let's uh, poke about some more and look at some more plants in, in uh, depth. Sounds good. So Kristen, not only are the plants beautiful, but I see you added some other elements like hardscape items that kind of give it some structure and balance. So tell us your inspiration for that. So I've been looking at some different elements of rock gardening, um, including this is a crevice garden is what it's called. And it's rocks placed closely on end and then little plants planted between the rocks. So in here I've used a lot of sedums, um, some hens and chicks, um, a really interesting little plant, there's one right to your right that has some flowers on it called a Louisia. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And some bell flowers. And these are all succulent plants that like to be dry, um, but are also fairly smaller scale. I'd like to further add some more almost alpine type plants as this goes along, but yeah, and this just provides a little bit of structure to the garden. It gives it some height. Okay. I also planted some of the bellflowers this year. Oh yeah. Uh, through the hottest days that we had, and thank goodness they're doing well. They're like very you said, tough. They, yeah, they're very very tough yet so pretty. Yes. And then I also noticed that you mixed in some potted plants. So what was the idea about that? How did you come up with the spacing and what so, you put in them? I used the potted plants to kind of fill in places where it felt like there were gaps and also to add different textures, um, thinking about the terracotta giving you a different, a different feel, um, and then I 
put kangaroo paws in these two terracotta pots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and kangaroo paws have a very interesting flower and they really add a lot of height and movement to the garden as well. I actually like using kangaroo paw as a cut flower because it lasts forever and Ooh. it kind of dries like that. So in floral arrangements it gives that crazy kind of height to it and interest. So I think that's a great plant. It's a good multifaceted plant. It is. It is. Such a good choice. So. Yeah, and yeah. then you left a lot of the gravel, obviously. I left gravel, a lot of the gravel visible. Gravel this is a gravel garden. Um, most of these plants would not grow in like super dense conditions with a lot of competition. Mm -hmm. um, they're used to kind of scrabbling for survival. Right. So, And then since there is gravel, um, do you have a problem with weeds or does that help? The gravel really helps with that. It does work as a mulch. It helps cut down on, on the amount of weeds we're pulling out of here, which is good because this sat empty for long enough that it developed quite the seed bank of uh, weed seeds. Right, I can imagine. <laughs> so. All right, so it's low maintenance. Fairly low as maintenance. As far as not much weeding. Not much watering. Not much watering. Not, of, not much trimming. Not much trimming. Everything will get, some stuff will get cut back in the fall and a lot of it gets cut back in the spring. Okay. Especially the silver foliaged plants like the artemisia and the Russian sage I'll probably cut back in the spring. Mm-hmm. So this sounds like perfect choice if you want a garden that you can kind of just sit back and enjoy. Yep, it's well suited for all those sunny hot spots people have in their yards that are just kind of a struggle. Right. So, I'm sure many people will find it an inspiration. I hope so. <laughs> yep, thank you Kristen. Thank you. So Kristen, the garden looks so great um, and it's grown so much since last year. So tell us, did you start out with small plants or were they big when you put them in? So we started out with mostly very small plants. A lot of them were in one gallon size pots or quarts or even smaller. Um, and a fair amount went in last year in August and September. And they got a chance to grow in the remaining season. And then also throughout this spring, they really put on a lot of growth, particularly these silver plants to our right. Um, they grew a lot, almost tripled in size. And so that's really added a lot of texture and made this garden feel a lot more finished in a shorter time period. Right. And then you mentioned that you put them in in August, which I know a lot of people are hesitant to plant in the summer. And they even think in the fall that there's not as much selection available. So they hold off till spring. But this is a prime example of how great everything looks at that time of year. So were there any special considerations with planting at that time of the year? So I am pretty lucky with this garden. It is a garden that is intended to feature plants that like to be dry and hot. So they took being planted in a tougher time of year pretty easily. We paid a little extra attention to them, but mostly they adapt really well to hot, dry climates. and. There are some considerations for plants not being available at the end of the year, which is when we started looking for plant material. And some of these plants were added this spring. Okay. So um, I've just been adding plants over the course of the season and we're pretty close to finished right now. Yeah, um, like I was saying, it really looks great. And I see there's a beautiful olive tree behind us. And I understand you said that was kind of repurposed it from was. a different spot. It used to live at our sister arboretum, Willowwood in Chester. And we've been bringing it here for this because it fits so beautifully with the style of this garden, which is a little bit Mediterranean in feel. We were actually saying before we started filming, right? We feel like we're kind of uh, in Italy here, you know, with the weather today fabulous. and with the plants and everything. So we feel like uh, it's a little mini vacation in the garden. Yeah, it's pretty perfect, isn't it? It is. It is. Well, everything looks great. Thank you. Maybe we could take a look at some of the other areas. That would be great. Uh, well, this was, this was really great. So yeah, actually it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this. Um, and there's a lot here that, that a homeowner could come, could see and could walk away with and uh, could apply at their own home. Especially the low maintenance. Yes. That's really a bonus. That's a biggie. So, and everyone's got that really dry, you know, maybe it's next to a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And again, you wouldn't want the small gravel next to a pool because it'll get in the pool. But you, are, but you got that dry baking spot. You're sitting there scratching your head going, what, what could I do right. with that? And, yep. uh, and the thought of, you know, using some different containers or picking up the theme of, oh, I'll try uh, something that looks Mediterranean in there with mm -hmm. some blue foliage and silver foliage uh, could really add a little pizzazz. 
perfect solution. Yeah, yeah. And then just add the, the gravel to it, because the nice thing about this is it doesn't really break down or decompose like mulch, so it lasts a little bit longer. So, Another good point. Yeah, so you get you get a little more mileage out of it. Yeah. And, then, or, and, and maybe the walkway itself here will give you know, oh, look at this walkway. Yeah. We need one of those in our backyard. So, yeah. So, uh, so anyway. Some, sometimes the gravel just flies at you. It you does. That? <laughs> I've been noticing that too. Like yeah. hail. <laughs> wow. On such a beautiful day. I know, go so, figure. But you well, know, there's another garden here. Yeah, let's check it out. Yeah, let's go. All right, so, great. So we'll be back. So uh, I really like, and I like how the water sits on the salvia leaves like that. So pretty. Yeah. It makes it almost sparkly like my shoes. It does. I like your shoes. I know, so, thank you. Very sparkly. Yeah. So uh, can um, can we go pick those olives over there? There's two olives on that shade. Uh, don't you, aren't you supposed to brine them first? Oh, I, I don't know anything about. But well, maybe if you put them in a martini, like they'd that. be okay. I don't know. Ooh. We'll have to ask. We'll see if we can grab them. Later. Do you have a couple glasses? Yeah, I do. Oh, let's go grab them. So Kristen, Bruce and I had a nice little walk around the garden and now that we found this bench, it's the perfect spot to chat a little about the inspiration for this one. So this one started with the bromelia that's behind us. Okay. Um, I saw one at a different garden last summer and I was just instantly in love. I was like, I have to use these. Mm -hmm. So I started messing around, oh, I think I was in like PowerPoint, just putting pictures together just to see what looked good. And oh, okay. I, we had used the um, the grass that's blooming behind us, the red grass. It's called ruby grass. Mm -hmm. um, we had used it last year in a planting, and I'd really liked it. And I was like, that'll definitely play well with this bromeliad. So that was an immediate key part of the design. Okay. So, and then I added the digiplexus, which are an interesting hybrid between foxgloves and another tropical plant called an isoplexus. Okay. Yeah. Um, is I really loved that pink color they have on their tongues that just like really picks up the pink that's in the bromeliads and the pink that's in the grasses. Um, and there was a brief period of time where I thought I wouldn't be able to find them. And that was when the little purple daisies got added. Oh, okay. So that's sort of how this kind of came together. Mm -hmm. um, and we got really lucky and we actually were able to grow a lot of the ruby grass from seed ourselves. Oh, okay. So that was a really fun way to kind of just get this garden started a little so easier. you purchased some and then you grew some? We purchased some and then we grew some and we were trying to see if we could propagate more of our own plant material for our annual plantings this year and we were pretty successful which was great. Oh nice. So how big were the ones that you bought? So they were in four inch pots. They were a little bit bigger than the ones that we grew ourselves, but okay. the ones we grew ourselves have pretty much caught up now. So Yeah, I can't tell the difference. Everything yeah. looks great. It worked out really nicely for us. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a good experiment. Yes, and I just, I love the way that you coordinated all the colors. I, I mean, like you were spot on, really. So. I, I definitely like to make sure I get pictures of everything I'm thinking about using and put it all together to help me make sure the colors are in the right family. Now, do you, do you ever find, especially if you grow something from seed, that the color winds up not being exactly what it was supposed to be, or is it usually pretty accurate? If I'm guessing from online photos, sometimes I'm a little bit off, and that can be kind of frustrating. It's hard to tell when photos have been altered. 
Oh, that's Unless a good point. Unless it's a photo I've taken myself and I know what the plant looked like because I physically saw it, mm -hmm. which does help for me. Okay, gotcha. So. Well, everything came together perfectly. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I had a lot of fun putting this one together. It has a lot of different elements, which gives it a lot of character. Well, it's a great design. You did an excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> The one thing that I think everybody has really found interesting about this gardening is the sheer quantity of plants that you've used. So uh, you didn't use one plant or two plants. You used a hundred plants of something and yes. 50 plants of something else, which really gives that impact. Yes. So, and the one thing that I found is funny this morning, I was watching someone as they walk down here, they tied their hand out and they're just going along and hitting the flowers of the tilinum, <laughs> which is perfect. Exactly what you want people to do. They're becoming involved with the yes. garden. I want people to interact with the garden, but I'm also laughing because I know that that's going to mean we have so many baby tilinums in the spring. <laughs> so the tilinum is the, the this red flower that's right behind me here. And uh, it's spectacular looking, and uh, but it does reseed. So that's one thing you have to be aware of that if right. you use it, you're gonna have it for a few years to come. But. but my goal with it was to make it look like an airy red cloud right along the edge of the garden. So you really just kind of feel like you're walking through it as you pass by. Yes. And the other plant which I've never seen before that you use this garden is what you referred to before as the blue daisy. Ah, uh, yes. So that is a plant called a burkea. It is, I believe, a South African plant. And it is a thistly kind of plant. If you were to touch it, the plant itself is very sharp. Mm -hmm. um, but it is also possibly hardy here. Possibly. So we're going to try and overwinter a few in the gravel garden mm -hmm. and see how we do. So, and, and, and what's neat about it is it produces the pups from the base, so it, it does, does. it's not just a single stem, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the season goes on. Yes. I love that. I'm hoping by a little bit later in the season we'll have quite a lot of purple flowers in here, which should be a good show. That would be a very good show. So, uh, and of course the, the thing which started it all was Harvey's Pride. Yes. So, uh, which I happen to be a fan of bromeliads. So uh, I yes. just, and I think they're not used to the extent that they should be, but. I agree, I think they're pretty underused and I saw Harvey's Pride this year and I was just instantly enchanted. Um, so I think you're quite right that they're a pretty fabulous plant. So. Um, I wanted a few more than two, but they're over here happily making pups. So hopefully next year we'll be able to use a few more of them somewhere. And so just so everyone knows, what's a pup? So a pup is a little offset of another of a bromeliad, and they usually start on the Harvey's Prides at the base. And when they're a little bigger, you'll be able to separate them from the parent plants. Yep. So. And produce more. Yes, more and more. And uh, if you haven't grown bromeliads, you can actually overwinter them in your garage. Really, uh, uh, that's heated, so it's not just a freezing garage. But uh, they're very, very low care, and uh, I think they should really be used more in yes. the garden. They're very tough. They're tolerant of a lot of conditions. These guys are out here in full blazing sun all day and it does not seem to bother them at all. So in fact, they've even gotten a nice rosy glow to them. So, yes, uh, <laughs> I maybe a little. <laughs> so I love that. So, uh, so again, uh, congratulations on our garden, really well done and, and hopefully inspiring a lot of people. I hope so, thank you, Bruce. <laughs> a beautiful day is coming to an end. So the sunshine is still out, but mm -hmm. and I think I've got a little bit of a tan. How about you? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a perfect day today. Yeah, and it's a perfect. We had the perfect gardens though to look at. They were hot and dry, perfect for a sunny day. That's true. And uh, and again, um, hats off to Kristen for all her design work and how she helped us with some of the inspiration that got her going. And, uh, yeah. uh, continues to keep her going, so I think that's fun. That's right. But uh, I saw well, there was a nice seating area over there too. Yes, yes. So I might have to check that out before we leave. Okay, well, let's do that indeed. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but and um, I think I, the one thing that I sort of took away from today was the fact that you don't plant just one plant or two plant. You think in, in big numbers. And I think that's a good point. And I think every garden center is going to love me saying that too, because they go, "Oh, good! They're not going to come and buy one plant anymore. They're going to buy ten or something." That's <laughs> right. People have to load up their cars. Yes, I like that. <laughs> so uh, and it helps the whole nursery and it helps the gardens too. So it does. But, uh, well, let's go check out those tables. So all uh, right, that sounds so, good. And uh, and you know what I was watching a lady do this day when she was coming in, she was going along like this and hitting them all, and I thought, you know. That looks like a lot of fun. So it uh, does. So uh, and of course, as I'm doing this, I bet somewhere around here, Kristen is going. Look at you dropping all those seeds all over the place. My gosh! So, as long as people just touch them and just don't start pulling right. them out, that would be bad. And you know what's happening next yeah. month? We're, what's we're, happening? Oh, we're going to be looking at sculptures. 
Ooh, Ooh that's that be fun. fun. Yeah. That would be a yeah. whole lot of fun. Yeah, and, I, and they look like people, too. Oh, Just wow. like people, I heard. I heard. I don't know. So okay. We're going to have to find out. This will be a fun experiment. Yeah. At a recent gathering of green industry professionals, we asked these pros to give you some tips and tricks. Here's a few of them. So today we have John Bellini joining us from Bellini Contracting Company. So John, I've been hearing a lot of people talk about native plants. What's your feelings on that? Oh, that's a great question. It's, it's one of my new passions. Um, native plants, not only do they sequester and remove uh, carbon from the air, but they're, they're a dominant um, pollinator and um, they attract a lot of wildlife, a lot of bees, and you know, they're just something I really, really enjoy working with. Okay, so are you trying to incorporate more of them into the landscapes that you install now? Yes, each and every job I try to make sure that at least 30% of the plants are native plants. And there are certain jobs that we do that are just all native plants. Mm -hmm. And people ask me, is it really, you know, besides the value of the carbon and all that, I mean, what else? And to be honest with you, they're so important to balance our ecosystem. They really do an uh, unbelievable job, again, in producing bees and butterflies and providing food for, for, for habitat. It's just really a, a simple thing that we can do to help mm -hmm. the environment. Okay, so for the native plants, do you find that they're easier to source than some of the other varieties maybe that you've used in the past? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, every plant list provides somewhat of a challenge, mm -hmm. but surprisingly, you, you'll see in most nurseries, there's more and more native plants. Um, some people don't even know that they're native plants. Some of them, my favorite are like the coneflower, the black-eyed Susan. They're plants people use every day and they're native plants. So try to use them. Yeah, and you're exactly right. People would never think that some of these were native plants and they're so pretty, readily available. So that's, it, I think, what people should do. I do too. I really do. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So we have John Bellini joining us today from... Yeah. <laughs> I was going good. What the heck? Oh, I'm so sorry. Cut. Bye. It's a television. The camera rolls. <laughs>